Hi everybody, my name is Huey Lin. Uh, I'm with the Adele Congenital Heart Program here at the DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center here in Houston Methodist. Um, we're going to be talking about adult congenital heart disease. The title of my talk is Primer for the Images, em, sorry, Imager. And this is going to be a rapid fire run through some of the common adult congenital heart disease and adult congenital heart disease issues that we run into on a daily basis. So if you want to participate, if you have questions, please pull out your cell phones now and send a text message to 37607, that's 37607, and what you're going to text is DeBakey, that's D-E-B-A-K-E-Y. If you want to get online on your computer, um, since you're probably watching this on your computer anyway, you can log on to pollev, that's P-O-L-L-E-V dot com slash DeBakey, D-E-B-A-K-E-Y. So if you have questions, please send them our way and we'll stop intermittently to answer those questions um, and it'd be great to continue the dialogue afterwards as well online. So these are my disclosures. So I'm a speaker for Abumed. Um, I am on the DSMB, the Data Safety Monitoring Board for the Compassion 3 um, trial. Uh, I am a course director for Gore and I receive research support from Siemens Health and Ears. But more importantly, one of the things that often happens to me is that this is how imagers feel whenever they see us coming down the hallway to talk to them about one of our studies. So to help to alleviate this, we're going to talk a little bit about congenital heart disease. So to begin with, let's talk about what the scale is. For those of us who are in practice in adult congenital heart disease, this is how we actually see it, um, is that it's actually going to be a toddler wave that's going to be hitting us soon. And the reason for this is if you think about how things started, Really, everything started in 1953 with cardiopulmonary bypass. And if you back up a little bit, in fact, actually, it goes back all the way to 1944 with the advent of the blade Thomas shunt, which allowed cyanotic patients to survive childhood for the very first time. And then thereafter, basically what we saw was every decade we saw a complex congenital heart surgery repair that again allowed another population of complex congenital heart disease patients to survive through childhood. Um, ending most recently in the 1980s with the Norwood, Glenn, and Fontan procedures that allowed single ventricle patients, including the hypoplastic left heart syndrome patients, now to survive to adulthood. And now we're actually seeing these patients enter into their third and fourth, and some of them even into their fifth decades. And so what that means is with these successful surgeries and the revolutionary changes in cardiac surgery in the 1950s and onward, we now see a very robust and growing adult congenital heart disease population which just like Mickey, who is the sorcerer's apprentice, is now seeing the effects of it um, as these patients begin to uh, enter into our daily workflow. So this is what it looks like if you want to look at the actual numbers. So in light gray, these are adults with congenital heart disease coming to the hospital for inpatient admissions. And in dark gray, these are kids with congenital heart disease coming into hospital for admissions. And this is what it looks like as far as that, I'm sorry, the other way around. Dark gray is adults with congenital heart disease coming into the hospital. And as you can see here, adults with congenital heart disease are rising very rapidly going into this study, which um, only shows us up to 2010. You can imagine today in 2020, that these patients probably are a uh, larger number than pediatric admissions with congenital heart disease. And at this point in time, when this study was originally published, we were estimating there's about 1.4 million adults with congenital heart disease in the United States. Now, in 2020, we think it's probably closer to about 2 million adults with congenital heart disease, which vastly outnumbers actually the pediatric patients with congenital heart disease. And in fact, if you think about it, it affects 1% of all live births, um, and you have, every patient has at least 60 to 70 years of life exposure, or in other words, a lifetime of exposure. That's a lot of patients that we're going to be seeing. We estimate that in Houston, there's probably anywhere between 30 to 40,000 adults with congenital heart disease in Houston and its surrounding area alone. So to that end, we need to talk about adults with congenital heart disease and how to actually work them up when they come through the cardiovascular imaging lab. And so today, I'm going to explain a basic framework for understanding congenital heart disease um, and sort of how to actually think about it in a way that's slightly different from what others have done in the past. We're going to describe some of the important issues that um, arise in adults with congenital heart disease, especially those who have undergone surgical correction in the past. We're going to talk about the indications for referral, which is pretty simple. Um, pretty much every single adult with congenital heart disease should be seen by an adult congenital heart disease program or specialist at least once in their lifetime. And this is basically what the framework looks like. So we're going to talk about basic shunts and their complications. 
And then we're going to talk about right-sided lesions. We're going to talk about left-sided lesions. And then we're going to talk about discordance. And this is the way I like to sort of break down most of congenital heart disease. And then finally, we're going to talk about single ventricle briefly and how that actually affects our patients. So to begin with, we're going to just talk about some basic physiology in the context of how we actually diagram these patients to give you a sense of uh, in preparation for how we're actually going to um, talk about these lesions. So commonly you'll see this. This is called a Mullins diagram, and this is our communication tool. This is typically what we use to communicate what the lesion looks like, what the hemodynamics look like, and what the oximetry looks like to give us a better sense of what the repair has done to the patient and what the complications of that is. So this is a very common uh, communication tool called the Mullins diagram, and you'll see this used in our surgical conferences for the ACHD program. The other way we like to communicate is using this box diagram. And so to think about the basic physiology, this is typically what I usually use to communicate with patients as well as with, um, with learners as we're talking about different diseases. So for example, we would illustrate the superior vena cava and inferior vena cava venous uh, flow coming back to the right atrium and the right ventricle, then coming out to the pulmonary artery into the pulmonary circulation, and then coming back through the pulmonary venous circulation back to the left atrium, left ventricle, and then out the aorta, through the systemic circulation and then coming back through the systemic venous circulation over again. So this is a typical box diagram and you'll see this come up um, in a little bit when we start talking about these specific lesions. So to start off we'll talk about shunts. So this is the way we typically think about shunts. So um, typically we would break it down into pre-tricuspid lesions. So pre-tricuspid lesions tend, uh, so in other words, a, um, a shunt that occurs above the tricuspid valve or before the tricuspid valve. And that is typically an atrial septal defect. That's kind of the typical one that we think about. The other lesion that we think of as a pre-tricuspid lesion is partial anomalous pulmonary venous return or less commonly you'll see in adulthood total anomalous pulmonary venous return. The reason why I say less commonly is typically by adulthood they've most commonly been repaired. So the other way we break it down is a post-tricuspid lesion. And in post-tricuspid lesions, such as a ventricular septal defect or patent ductus arteriosus, typically at birth, those patients will tend towards left-sided heart failure. We will see them develop left atrial and left ventricular enlargement. Sometimes you'll even see so much left ventricular enlargement that they develop functional uh, mitral regurgitation as well. Now, that all assumes that you have a normal pulmonary vascular resistance. You might argue that when you see a VSD or a large PDA in adulthood that you will actually see patients who don't have left side enlargement anymore, they'll have right side enlargement. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. And again, that comes back to those patients do not anymore have a normal pulmonary vascular resistance. So let's talk about the atrial septal defects as sort of the primary uh, lesion that we see that's a pre-tricuspid lesion. So the most common uh, atrial septal defect, of course, is the secundum atrial septal defect, as you can see here. The second most common is the primum atrial septal defect, which is also commonly associated with other lesions, such as a ventricular septal defect, a cleft mitral valve, etc. We won't talk too much about that today because we have a lot of ground to cover. The third most common is the sinus venosus defect, which here you can see illustrated both as a superior sinus venosus defect and an inferior sinus venosus defect. When you see the sinus venosus defects, actually also any of the other atrial septal defects, you must look for a partial anomalous pulmonary venous return. And that is a very, very important part of the evaluation. Um, that can rarely also occur with secundum atrial septal defects as well. So it's an important part of the workup when you're seeing one of these patients coming through the cardiovascular imaging suite. And then finally, the least common defect is called the coronary sinus defect, which is also sometimes known as an unroofed coronary sinus. That lesion is commonly associated with a persistent left-sided SVC, but not always. And that persistent left-sided SVC, as you all probably know, drains to the coronary sinus, which means that it's an obligate also right-to-left shunt, where the left upper extremity circulation, venous circulation comes back and can potentially drain to the left atrium as a result of that unroofed coronary sinus. So focusing specifically on the secondary atrial septal defect, this also happens to be, um, in addition to being the most common, also the lesion that we can actually treat with transcatheter techniques on a regular basis. And so currently there are, are a couple FDA approved devices. This is one of the two FDA approved devices. These are the typical indications for treatment. If there's evidence of right atrial enlargement or right ventricular enlargement, a QB to QS of greater than 1.5 or greater. However, these lesions also have to demonstrate a low pulmonary vascular resistance and typically must have a pulmonary vascular resistance, a systemic vascular resistance ratio of less than two thirds.
For these patients, both repaired and unrepaired, especially if they're repaired late in adulthood, you need to be aware of the possibility of atrial fibrillation that may, that, and that risk may continue to persist. There is also a risk of the development of pulmonary hypertension. There's a risk of actually having a residual shunt. And if you do see a residual shunt in the secundum atrial septal defect, you should also consider the possibility that they may have had partial anomalous pulmonary venous return that was not addressed during their um, secundum atrial septal defect evaluation. Then finally, if there is a residual shunt, you also have to be concerned about the possibility of having a, um, a paradoxical embolism causing a cryptogenic stroke. So moving on to the post-tricuspid shunt. Um, so the typical hallmark post-tricuspid shunt is a ventricular septal defect. Now, there's a lot of different discussion about the different types of anatomy, and I would refer you to a most recent document that has come out trying to consolidate all the different types of um, VSD anatomies. Um, that's a little bit beyond the scope of this current talk. Um, so I'll focus on the things that we typically run into once we see these patients in adulthood. So typically, if it's a completely unrepaired large ventricular septal defect, these are the patients that we will see with Eisenmenger syndrome. And that is, um, as I mentioned earlier, a, system, a situation in which we have a large ventricular septal defect. You no longer have, strictly speaking, left to right shunt because the pulmonary vascular resistance has increased, probably almost to the level of the systemic vascular resistance, such that there is a balance in the circulation where there is bidirectional shunting through the ventricular septal defect. These patients are very complicated and have a whole host of different types of issues that arise from that. Um, that, again, is beyond the scope of this current talk. The other issue that you'll commonly see with ventricular septal defects is the development of endocarditis. Um, although currently there are no guidelines that recommend continued um, uh, bacterial endocarditis prophylaxis, these are the patients that you do have to be aware of, uh, have a risk for it. Um, that does change if the patient has already had a history of bacterial endocarditis, and those patients who will, will require secondary prevention of bacterial endocarditis. Um, typically, however, if they have a small VSD, those patients will have a quote-unquote restrictive VSD. And that is characterized by having a high-velocity jet going through the ventricular septal defect, suggesting that the flow through the VSD is restrictive in nature and does not cause um, significant shunt physiology. To that end, however, if the VSD is right below the aortic valve, those patients I tend to like to image, um, um, I'm sorry, continue surveillance imaging, primarily because there can potentially be the cause of aortic valve leaflet prolapse as a result of that high velocity jet going through the VSD run, right underneath the aortic valve leaflet. And so those patients I will continue to image over time. Then finally, if there's a large ventricular septal defect, but not the development of Eisenmenger syndrome, um, you often have to look for the possibility that there may be a persistent right ventricular outflow tract obstruction, suggesting that there may actually be a tetralogy type of physiology rather than just simply a VSD alone, especially if that patient is presenting unrepaired with a large VSD in adulthood. So with that, let's move on to the right-sided lesions. So one of the most important things that we talk about in adult congenital heart disease is that once you identify one lesion, you need to start looking for other lesions that come in those um, families. So once you start seeing a right-sided lesion of some kind, whether it's obstruction versus um, regurgitation, that's a patient that you really need to hone in on all the other parts of the right side of the heart to see if there are other associated lesions. So for example, that can occur on the level of the tricuspid, the subvalvular apparatus of the, um, of the RVOT. That can exist as valvular pulmonic stenosis, supervalvular pulmonic stenosis, or even branch pulmonary arterial stenosis extending all the way into the uh, distal branches of the pulmonary artery. And so when you see a patient with, who has one of these right-sided lesions, it's important to continue to evaluate whether or not there are other right-sided lesions as well. And so we'll talk about that specifically. So the common lesion that we typically look at with right-sided obstructions is tetralogy of Fallot. So to hone in on what actually happens, because typically these patients are repaired by the time they see us, one of the most important things to remember is that a repair is not a cure. So what are the goals of tetralogy flow repair? So typically, the patient with tetralogy flow has a lesion that reduces the flow out the right ventricle into the pulmonic circulation. So that reduction in flow exists in the form of multiple levels of obstruction. 
Here you can see illustrated that there are muscle bundles right in the right ventricle outflow tract that result from right ventricle hypertrophy obstructing flow out of the right ventricle outflow tract. The other thing that you'll notice is that the pulmonic valve itself is small, as is the um, immediate supervalvar apparatus. Um, and that is a very common issue. And then finally, of course, you also see the ventricular septal defect, which is one of the hallmark lesions of Tetralogy of Fallot. So what the surgeon has to do is to resect out those muscle bundles that obstruct the right ventricle outflow tract. But also because the valvar and the supervalvar apparatus of the um, patient also is small and obstructive, what the, pa what the surgeon has to do is typically make a, um, a, um, a cut across the pulmonic valve annulus and patch and enlarge it. And so this is typically what we call a transannular patch. Um, so most of the patients that we are seeing in adulthood these days have undergone this type of surgical repair. So a transannular patch and of course a VSD repair as well as a um, resection of the RV muscle bundles. If you can imagine making a transannular patch like this to make it as large as possible to allow the patient to make it to adulthood without an additional surgery leaves the patient with a very high risk of having severe pulmonic regurgitation, if not frank severe pulmonic regurgitation. And that, of course, then leads to a situation that pretty much all of our patients, once they reach adulthood, are going to need some sort of pulmonic valve replacement. And that's estimated to be greater than 90% at this time. So what does that actually mean for our patients? So this is a typical uh, patient of ours. Uh, so he's a 36-year-old man with tetralogy of flow. He was repaired at age one. He comes into the office for the very first time to see our adult congenital heart program, and he states that he's asymptomatic. In fact, he says that he can lift weights, he can work out, he does mixed martial arts on the side, but on the way out the door, he tells us that he has occasional palpitations. Well, we know that the patient probably has at least moderate, if not frankly, severe pulmonic regurgitation, um, and so we have a concern about what these palpitations may uh, signify. And so we have him wear an event monitor, and this is what we get. So, as we would potentially expect, this patient has ventricular tachycardia. And why did this happen? Well, when we look at the cardiac MRI for this patient, that this is what happens from a lifetime of pulmonic insufficiency or pulmonic regurgitation. So what you can see here is that basically you have just to and fro flow going back and forth across the pulmonic valve. And um, as you can see, the entire right ventricle outflow tract as well as the right ventricle has severely dilated in response to a lifetime of pulmonic regurgitation. In fact, you could argue that there's really no valvar apparatus whatsoever. And at this point, what's happened is the right ventricle is large so much that it's compressing on the left ventricle and it's take to, taken up much of the chest. So of course, this is not a patient that we can treat with transcatheter valve technology. This is a patient who requires a surgical pulmonic valve replacement. And typically, most centers are using a bioprosthetic pulmonic valve, while some centers do occasionally use a mechanical pulmonic valve replacement. So you can imagine that this patient who's 36 years of age at this point in time for the pulmonic valve replacement is going to need another pulmonic valve replacement sometime between 10 to 15 years down the line. And so the patient does great um, in his post-operative period, and he's discharged within a week. But as I mentioned, the patient will probably need another pulmonic valve replacement anywhere between age 46 to 50. And that's where transcatheter valve technology becomes extremely powerful. So this is one of the two um, FDA approved transcatheter valve technologies for the pulmonic valve in the United States at this point. This is called the Melody Valve. And this is a bovine jugular venous valve that's been sutured onto a platinum iridium stent and deployed via a balloon deployed system that's introduced through the femoral vein or other venous uh, circulation. So here you can see it being um, uh, implanted into uh, another type of RVDPA conduit. And as you can see here with balloon expansion, the valve stent is fully deployed. And at that point, you have a competent valve in position. So this has completely changed the way we treat our patients, as you can imagine, because that, that adult who comes in at, um, in their second or third decade and gets a surgical pulmonic valve replacement will continue to need care from that standpoint. And this is what it looks like. The other valve, of course, is the Sapien um, from Edwards. So in Tetralogy Fallot, uh, the message that's very important is that these patients will continue to come back to see us because of continued recurrent issues from the pulmonary, uh, pulmonary valve standpoint. 
And again, as I mentioned, one of the important things to think about is that they will continue to need pulmonic valve replacements probably throughout their lifetime. Additionally, one of the important assessments that you will need to do when, the, when uh, you're imaging these patients is to look at the entire right side of the circulation, the subvalvar, the valvar, and the supervalvar um, par portions of the pulmonic valve, as well as going into the pulmonary arteries, because these patients very commonly will also have pulmonary arterial stenosis, either native lesions or as a result of the way they were repaired. Additionally, for those who have had long-standing pulmonic valve regurgitation and severe RV enlargement, those patients are at risk for ventricular arrhythmias and even potentially sudden cardiac death. One of the less commonly stated issues that these patients often encounter is the development of an aortic root aneurysm and even aortic regurgitation. And so these patients continue to require recurrent evaluation and potentially intervention. And so these are some of the most common patients that we typically see in cardiovascular imaging. So let's move on to left-sided lesions. So the poster child for the left-sided lesion is, of course, the Schoen's syndrome, um, which most people actually consider actually a very rare one. It's a true Schoen's syndrome. But um, as uh, those of you who are very student in the audience know, Schoen's syndrome begins with potentially mitral valve involvement. And remember that mitral valve involvement can be not only the mitral valve itself, it can also be the supervalvular structures as well as subvalvular structures. Also, um, there can be core triatriotum in certain situations. Um, and then the lesions can also involve the subvalvular apparatus, including um, uh, subvalvular AS, um, including um, uh, a subvalvular membrane. It can also involve valvar AS, including the bicuspid and monocuspid and even quadricuspid aortic um, valve diseases. It can include supervalvar aortic stenosis, which is its own very complicated syndrome, um, and it also is beyond the scope of this discussion. But then finally, remember that these left-sided lesions can involve anywhere along the aortic circulation, including um, the arch um, in, and resulting in arch uh, issues as well as coarctation, and finally even middle aortic syndrome. So when you see one left-sided lesion, you need to consider whether or not any of these other areas can be involved as well as part of due diligence of the evaluation of these patients. So we'll start off with, uh, I'm sorry, for this, uh, for representative lesion here, we'll, we'll talk about coarctation of the aorta. So remember to start thinking about coarctation of the aorta when you see a young patient in the office who has uh, hypertension, um, especially if there is differential blood pressures, either in the upper extremities or the upper and lower extremities. And of course, in order to detect that, you have to assess that when you're evaluating a young patient in the office with hypertension. So typically, we do four extremity blood pressures in the office every time when we see a patient with, uh, with hypertension who is young. One of the major issues, again, is that repair does not mean cured. So that means that we continue to need to evaluate these patients who have quote unquote had a coarctation repair for the development of recurrent coarctation or even aneurysm formation. It has been reported that cerebral aneurysms are commonly associated with coarctation. Some people have reported as high of a frequency as 10%. And so therefore, we typically evaluate these patients with one-time cerebral vascular imaging in the form of a CTA or an MRA, one time in, uh, during their evaluation. We do think it's necessary to continue serial CTA or MRA imaging of their thoracic aortas to evaluate, again, as I mentioned before, the recurrence of coarctation, or more importantly, aneurysm formation, because some of these patients are at high risk for the development of an aortopathy or aortic aneurysm, especially at the site of repair. And then finally, bicuspid aortic valve is very common in these patients. Some people report a frequency as high as 50% of patients with aortic coarctation. Here, we see a nice CT scan, a 3D reconstruction of a CT, in which we actually have a patient with complete interruption of the aorta, which is, of course, the most extreme form. One of the things that you see here is that the, um, it's just distal to the left subclavian artery, and very prominently you see the very severe collateral circulation in the intercostals surrounding the, uh, sorry, surrounding the total interruption of the aorta. So, um, this is what it looks like on invasive angiography when we have this total interruption. Um, so this is a 42-year-old man with severe hypertension. He had such severe hypertension that he'd already had an MCA stroke by the time he was, he was sent to us um, two years prior to his presentation to seeing us. 
despite four blood pressure medications, his blood pressure was still 250 over 110. And by four extremity blood pressure evaluation, he had a 70 millimeter gradient by non-invasive evaluation. So in order to treat this patient, what we did was we used the Nikonen RF perforation wire um, to cross this. And what you can see here is we've used here multimodality imaging. We've used a preoperative CT scan to map a 3D road map in the hybrid operating room. Um, and here you see that match with the digital subtraction angiography. And now we're carefully burning through with the RF perforation wire. And now we've snared out the RF perforation wire. So we've burned through. And then so once we get across with the wire, we can put the sheath across. And that pretty much sets us home free. We take this covered uh, stent and plant it successfully. And we've completely recanalized the thoracic aorta. So as I mentioned, with left-sided obstructions, beware that when you have one lesion, you can have combination of lesions. Typically, things to look for are involvement in the aortic valve, um, consisting of aortic stenosis or aortic regurgitation, coarctation or other arch abnormalities, mitral regurgitation. These patients often, if they have evidence of aortic uh, involvement, that, um, need to be assessed regularly for thoracic aortic aneurysms. Those with coarctations need to be assessed at least once for cerebral aneurysm in the setting of coarctation. And then one of the things that we often see that's very important um, that needs to be evaluated is if the patient has undergone heart transplant, it actually turns out, no surprise, that the thoracic aortic disease continues to persist. So even if they've had an arch repair or a coarctation repair, they continue to have the risk of thoracic aortic aortopathy, and they need to continue to have regular assessment for the development of thoracic aortic aneurysms. This continues to persist for those patients who actually had a, a heart transplant in childhood, especially those who had hypoplastic left heart syndrome. So that is something to continue to think about when you're seeing the patient who has quote unquote had a heart transplant and quote unquote had been cured. So moving on. So I've taken a waste bucket term of discordance um, to characterize multiple different lesions. And we'll talk about each of those in, um, uh, separately. So one of the most common complex congenital heart lesions is transposition in the great arteries. And here first we're going to talk about complete transposition in the great arteries, also known as detransposition in the great arteries. So these patients, when they're born, are fairly ill. The reason for this is, of course, you have transposition. So in other words, the right ventricle gives rise to the aorta. And of course, what that means is that once this baby is born, they have blue blood coming from the right side of the heart going to the aorta and the systemic circulation coming back, of course, bluer through the systemic venous circulation. Because their circulations are in parallel, they have the red blood going through the left side of the heart going to the pulmonary circulation through the lungs coming back redder, if you will, through the pulmonary venous circulation. Of course, this is not compatible to life. So what that means is that these patients are sick immediately after they're born and they need some sort of palliation almost immediately. Many of them continue to have persistent patent ductus arteriosus, which allows for some shunting, which can potentially protect that neonate against the initial issues. And so some of these patients are kept on a prostaglandin drip to maintain the patent ductus arteriosus. However, many of them, for many of those patients, that is not sufficient. And so they need to undergo something called a Rashkin septosomy. So the Rashkin septosomy is a balloon atrial septosomy in which a balloon is pushed across the patent foramen valley into the left atrium and pulled across to rip a hole in the atrial septum to create an atrial septal defect that allows mixing at the atrial level. Once there is definitive mixing at the atrial level, that can actually allow that baby to make it through the first several hours of life, if not possibly several days to weeks to months. And so that was one of the most important um, developments in the uh, treatment of transposition of the great arteries because it could be done via a catheter instead of open heart surgery, which had been the first version of the septectomy. So thereafter, there was the development of the atrial switch, which you will hear termed as either a Senning, 
or a mustard procedure. So the difference between a sending or a mustard procedure is the following. A mustard procedure uses exogenous materials such as bovine pericardium to create this atrial switch. The sending is a much more difficult or complicated procedure that requires the use of the patient's own atrial tissue to create this switch. So the atrial switch is the following. Typically what happens is that the systemic venous circulation, the SVC and the IVC, are baffled to the left atrium, which then gives rise to the left ventricle, where the blue blood is then pumped to the pulmonary circulation, now through the pulmonary artery. And of course, um, that blood is oxygenated and returns to the pulmonary veins, which are then subsequently baffled to the right atrium, which gives rise to the right ventricle. And then that red blood is pumped to the systemic circulation, giving oxygenated blood to the systemic circulation and coming back blue through this SVC and IVC again. Now, the problem with this um, quote unquote solution or palliation, which is the phrase we like to use now, is that the right ventricle continues to serve as the systemic ventricle. That continues to re remain a challenge throughout the course of this patient's life because, as you can imagine, in the setting of pulmonary hypertension, the right ventricle is not ideally suited to face the load of the systemic circulation. And that continues to persist even with this palliation. So, to give you an example, um, this is actually the patient that really got me into congenital heart disease to begin with. Um, this was a 28-year-old man I saw when I was in fellowship in St. Louis. He had detransposition of the great arteries, status post and atrial switch procedure, and he was actually playing softball um, when he was running from, home, from third base to home and he suddenly collapsed. Luckily, he got bystander CPR by healthcare professionals until the EMS arrived, and when EMS arrived, they found that he was in ventricular fibrillation um, using an AED and he was defibrillated successfully on site and brought to our ICU. Of course, when he arrived in our, I'm sorry, in our emergency room, he actually had a pH of 6.8. He was resuscitated successfully thereafter and um, walked out of the hospital a week later after he'd had a secondary prevention defibrillator implanted. Of course, during the hemodynamic evaluation and cardiac catheterization, as expected, he had no coronary disease uh, to speak of, but at the end of the day, he still had the systemic right ventricle, which continued to present a risk. So one of the things that we always have to think about in transposition of the great arteries, um, specifically detransposition of the great arteries, that it has been palliated with an atrial switch, which is often called either a sending procedure or a mustard procedure, is that these patients will develop heart failure as a result of the failure of their systemic right ventricle. They will often um, have atrial arrhythmias as a result of the scar lines that are formed um, during their atrial switch surgical procedures. And one of the important things to think about is that those atrial arrhythmias can potentially predispose those patients to sudden cardiac death as they can potentially degenerate into ventricular fibrillation. So with that, I want to remind everybody um, that we are taking your questions. Text your questions um, once you've enrolled by texting DEBAKEY, D-E-B-A-K-E-Y, to 37607. Once you've joined, you can go ahead and text your questions or your comments. So let's go on. So it turns out that um, approximately 30 years ago, uh, I'm sorry, 35 years ago, um, patients in the United States began undergoing a second type of surgical repair for, transposition, for complete transposition of the great arteries, and that's called the arterial switch. And it's exactly what it sounds like. It had actually been tried earlier in history, however, they had been unsuccessful for one important reason. So here's what we're looking at. So what happens is that the, obviously the pulmonary artery is pulled forward so that it's connect, reconnected to the right ventricle. And of course, the aorta is, um, is divided and, and placed backwards so it's connected to the left ventricle. One of the key elements that became important to this is that the coronary arteries need to be translocated as well so they come off of the, left, the neo aorta or the left ventricle. And of course, that was one of the critical um, uh, opportunities that were missed during the early versions of this arterial switch procedure. Now, if you can imagine, this is typically done in a neonate because it's important to do this early on in the life of the baby. Because if it's not done early on in the life of the baby, the left ventricle becomes untrained um, and can no longer face the systemic circulation because it's chronically facing the pulmonic circulation. So what that means is this is typically a neonatal surgery that's done, and so um, these coronary buttons have to be translocated in a neonate. 
So that can potentially, and of course the pulmonary artery has to be pulled forward in the neonate, and that can potentially create the lesions that we typically see. So because these coronary buttons are sewn on neonate, there can be the risk of coronary arterial kinking or lesions. And that can manifest itself all the way from childhood into adulthood in the form of either cardiomyopathy or ischemia, or even of course, um, ventricular tachycardia um, in the coronary ischemic lesion. The other possibility, because of what's called the Lecompte maneuver, in which the pulmonary artery is pulled anteriorly, the patients can develop pulmonary arterial stenosis. Sometimes these patients are treated in childhood when these pulmonary arterial stenosis are seen. Sometimes it's seen in adulthood. And of course, because this is the, mo this is the um, current and modern contemporary um, treatment for these patients, um, this is what we will typically see um, in patients who are in their 20s and possibly even their 30s that are showing up into our clinics for evaluation at this point in time. And so what that means is that when you have a patient who presents in the emergency room with um, the evidence of a cardiomyopathy or an ST elevation um, who is in their 20s, it is entirely possible that the patient that you're facing who has had a median sternotomy is this type of patient who has a coronary arterial kinking or a lesion. So moving on, um, very commonly people um, use the phrase complex detransposition of the great arteries. And what that commonly means is transposition of the great arteries with a VSD or ventricular supplemental defect. And oftentimes those patients will undergo what's called a Rastelli repair. And what that means is that the VSD repair is made so that the left ventricle is baffled to the aorta. So the left ventricle can, continue, can actually serve as the systemic ventricle. Then um, the, uh, there is an RVDPA conduit used, either PTFE, Dacron, Bovine, uh, Pericardiomara, Homograft. I'm sure I'm missing some sort of um, RVDPA conduit in this list. But um, typically, it's um, RVDPA conduit, including a valve within it, is used um, to uh, make the pulmonary circulation from the right ventricle. And of course, these patients are at risk of actually having some sort of failure of the RVDPA conduit and the RVDPA uh, valve. Um, but they are also, of course, at risk for arrhythmias and heart failure in the setting of having undergone this intracardiac repair. The other thing that we can commonly see is there are issues with the VSD patch or even left ventral alpha tract obstruction due to that, um, that VSD patch. So this works much better when we actually have an interactive audience because typically I'll ask you to <laughs> vote on what you think this is. But we'll, that, we'll let that play one more time. Great, so hopefully one of you said this is L transposition of the great arteries, which is also unfortunately commonly called corrected, congenitally corrected transposition of the great arteries or CCTGA. So in the literature, this is reported to be less than 1% of congenital heart disease. And I put a question mark there because, um, as I'll talk about a little bit later, it can actually present as really asymptomatic and is an incidental finding. So I would actually argue that we don't truly know the prevalence of L transposition in the great arteries. So this is typically what we're facing. So we see the systemic venous circulation coming back through the SVC and IVC to the right atrium. But then the ventricles are L-looped. So what that means is the right atrium then gives, um, connects to the left ventricle via the mitral valve because the valves typically go with the ventricles. And then the left ventricle is then uh, connected to a discordant um, a great artery via the pulmonary artery. And then the pulmonary artery goes as expected to the lungs and then um, goes to the pulmonic circulation, comes back to the pulmonary veins to the left atrium as expected. Then you have the L looping of the ventricles so that the left atrium gives rise to the tricuspid and the right ventricle. Then the great artery is discordant here again, so the right ventricle then gives rise to the aorta, um, which goes through the systemic circulation, and the process continues. So the reason why it's called congenitally corrected transposition of the great arteries then is that you can see that there is, by, um, uh, um, by the way this patient is born, um, a quote-unquote congenital correction. So the patient has their own atrial switch. And because the atrial, atrial ventricular relationship is discordant and then the ventricular arterial relationship is discordant, therefore you have a quote-unquote congenitally corrected transposition.
The problem though, as you can see here, is that the right ventricle again serves as a systemic ventricle, and this can create a major problem for these patients over time. So again, atrial ventricular discordance and ventricular arterial discordance. One of the key phrases to remember is that the valves go with the ventricles. So the AV valves, the mitral valve, and the tricuspid valves are named according to the ventricles. And this is also commonly called L-looped ventricles with L-transposed great arteries. So this is a typical version of one of our, um, or our LTGA um, cardiac MRIs. So um, one of the key elements is that these patients can present with a wide spectrum of, um, of disease. Some of them can be asymptomatic and present as an incidental finding at, um, in their 80s. Some of them can be severely symptomatic all the way from childhood. And much of that is, depends on what they come with. So 1% <clears throat> of them are actually uncomplicated. Otherwise, um, some of them have a ventricular septal defect, sometimes reported as much as 70%. 40% um, of them have pulmonic stenosis. Many of that is, much of that is subvalvar in nature, sometimes related to the mitral valve. Many of them have a tricuspid abnormality. Um, much of that has been reported as an epstenoid appearance with an inferior displacement of the valve. And remember, that tricuspid abnormality is on the systemic uh, valve, I'm sorry, systemic ventricular side. So in other words, the systemic right ventricle, which can be fairly uh, significant in its clinical presentation. And of course, these patients are the ones that you will hear of on the boards that have AV, val AV node heart block. Um, and of course, um, that some people theorize is related to the his bundle being in an unusual position, but then they may even have an accessory AV node. And then um, there is the concern that there may be as high of a rate of spontaneous heart block as 2% a year. Um, and commonly, even worse, an issue um, after uh, repair of ventricular septal defect or tricuspid valve repair. And of course, these patients are also at risk of atrial tachyarrhythmias. One of the problems that we can run into is that there can be an RV lift, be, um, consistent with the fact that the right ventricle serves as a systemic um, pro, uh, ventricle. There can be a loud A2. Um, and there can be uh, tricuspid regurgitation giving you a whole systolic murmur. Um, there can be the sound of pulmonic stenosis, and there can be the sound of a ventricular septal defect. An EKG typically shows this PR prolongation, um, and one of the interesting things is that they can have the mis um, findings that are mistaken for an inferior infarct. One of the other very important things that also often shows up on the boards is this, that the chest x-ray is mesocardic. You can see the heart is lined up right with the spine. This is approximately 20%. Um, some of them may actually even have dextrocardia, and some of them um, may actually be um, cytosol, uh, um, excuse me, cytosolitis. Um, finally, um, pregnancy can be well tolerated if cardiac pulmonary exercise test shows that these patients are greater than 70 75% predicted. Um, if there is RV dysfunction as well as tricuspid regurgitation that is more than mild, um, that can definitely be uh, a potential source of complications during pregnancy. So finally, in the time that we have remaining, I'm going to touch on some basic issues with the single ventricle physiology. So the two types of single ventricle physiology um, that are most common um, and sort of a, um, representative lesions, although single ventricle physiology can result from many, many different types of lesions, are these two. First of all, tricuspid atresia. And the second one here is hypoplastic left heart. Um, for time considerations, I'm going to try to avoid talking about how hypoplastic left heart shows up at the very beginning of life. And is honestly typically not an issue that you're going to be dealing with in the adult realm. However, talking about hypoplastic left heart and how it's palliated becomes very important so that you can actually think about the subsequent lesions that we see in these patients, both in the um, palliated form as well as even after transplant. So as I mentioned, hypoplastic left heart is one of the combination left-sided lesions, which means, uh, and typically it's, um, it results from either aortic atresia or mitral atresia. And you can see serial left-sided lesions here represented by not only mitral atresia um, and the um, lack of development of the left ventricle, but also the aortic valve is small, as is the ascending aorta. So in order to get past this, these patients typically require some sort of systemic to pulmonary shunt. So here illustrated is a modified BT shunt, which is a small Gore-Tex shunt that's placed from the innominate artery to the right pulmonary artery. 
Other ways that some of these patients are being palliated now are the form of a PDA stent in the form of what's called the hybrid stage one palliation. What you also see here is in addition to creating a definitive form of pulmonary circulation via the BT shunt here, the, sorry, the modified BT shunt that you see here, is the need to augment ascending aortic flow. And the way this is done because the, aorta, the ascending aorta is small is that there is a side-to-side -side anastomosis formed with the pulmonary arterial trunk. So then once the pulmonary arterial trunk is used for this, it's divided and ligated from the um, the branch pulmonary arteries, and the branch pulmonary arteries get their pulmonary arterial circulation strictly from the modified BT shunt because the main pulmonary trunk is used to create the neo-aorta as you see here. The right ventricle then becomes the primary ventricle for both the pulmonary and the systemic circulations as you see here because there is now an atrial septal defect that allows pulmonary venous blood flow to return back to the systemic right ventricle via the tricuspid valve. So blood returns as the following. You have blue blood from the SVC and the IVC coming into the right atrium. You have red blood coming back from the pulmonary veins in the left atrium through the atrial septal defect into the right atrium. And this mixed circulation now goes to the tricuspid valve. Then you have that mixed purple blood going out the neo aorta, which was of course the former pulmonic valve, into the side to side anastomosis, which is um, of the quote unquote neo aorta, which is the pulmonic trunk fused to the small ascending aorta, which then gives rise to, of course, the pulmonary arteries, as well as the head and neck vessels. And then, of course, goes down to the descending aorta and gives rise to the blood flow in the descending aorta. You also then get that mixed blood flow going through the innominate artery through your modified BT shunt, um, and that gives you your pulmonary arterial circulation as well. So um, the problem with this is, of course, is that your systemic right ventricle is giving rise to the blood flow to both circulations, both the pulmonary arterial circulation as well as the systemic circulation. And this is not a good long-term solution. As well, because you have a small three to four millimeter uh, Gore-Tex shunt, that shunt can potentially clot and can result in infant mortality or um, what we call interstage mortality. So we need to find a next step. So the next step is called the Glenn shunt. And so the Glenn shunt is to take down that modified BT and then um, actually instead hook up the superior vena cava to the right pulmonary artery. And what that allows for now is that the venous blood flow from the upper extremities is now supplying the pulmonary arterial circulation. Obviously this can only be done if the pulmonary vascular resistance is low. The lower extremity uh, venous circulation comes back as prior um, into the right atrium, which mixes with the pulmonary venous circulation into the systemic ventricle, and then of course gets pumped to the common um, or neo-aortic trunk. Then finally, the third stage is called the Fontan. And typically in the Fontan, what happens is that the lower extremity venous circulation is now baffled to the pulmonary arterial circulation as well. So you have both SVC and IVC venous blood flows returning to the pulmonary arterial circulation. And then of course, then what gets pumped through the systemic ventricle is only the pulmonary venous return so that the patient is no longer blue. So the problem with Fontan is that we have a number of issues. You can imagine that in this setting, then we have an issue where we have elevated venous pressures. And what that can do is it can potentially result in congestion of the um, venous circulation throughout the entire body. And we think sometimes, we think that this may be related to a phenomenon called protein losing enteropathy. It can, of course, ele elevate the, hepatic, the risk of hepatic congestion, which results in liver failure, such that we now have a phenomenon called Fontan-associated liver disease. Of course, this results in cirrhosis and can potentially increase the risk, this, I'm sorry, the risk for hepatocellular carcinoma. Because these patients often develop collateral circulation um, going to the pulmonary arteries, they can be at risk for hemoptysis. So finally, what I want to touch on um, is the evolution of Fontan. So because we have um, a number of patients who are older um, and have had an early Fontan done, the early Fontan was performed in the following way. It's what we call the classic Fontan, which is also known as the atrial pulmonary Fontan. And it's exactly what it sounds like. The right atrium was taken to directly connect to the pulmonary arterial circulation. And this is commonly done through the right atrial appendage. And you can see it in the figure uh, um, labeled A. This was done as early as 1971. And so what that means is typically in our patients who have a Fontan in their 40s, 
uh, I'm sorry, uh, late 30s to 40s, typically will have an atrial pulmonary fontan. Patients thereafter underwent um, the advent of something called a lateral tunnel fontan. So a lateral tunnel fontan uses some sort of exogenous material to create a dam in the, uh, in the systemic venous atrium, or in this particular situation, the right atrium, which allows then the IVC to be baffled up to the SVC, which is then connected to the pulmonary circulation. Typically, in a lot of these patients, um, that dam actually also had a small hole made in it called a fenestration, um, and that allowed for unloading of the fontan immediately after the initial fontan surgery. That fontan fenestration can later be closed using a simple amplatzer device with a very uh, quick procedure, or left open if the patient requires that decompression of the venous, systemic venous circulation. Finally, um, the most recent um, advent is of the what's called an extracardiac conduit or extracardiac fontan. Um, and so what you can see here is an exogenous um, graft material such as um, uh, EPTFE is used to create a conduit from the IVC to the pulmonary arterial circulation. And of course, the SVC is um, um, as anastomosed and to side to the pulmonary arterial circulation. And it's exactly as it's called. So, there are different potential complications with each of these, and it becomes very important to know what the patient has for, um, in their, from their previous operative ward or from the patient's history in order to assess for the potential complications for this. So um, we'll talk really briefly about the trouble that we can have with Fontan in this particular case that I ran across when I was um, in fellowship training. So this is a three-year-old who underwent Fontan. Um, she had uh, hemodynamics by catheterization that demonstrated that she was suitable for Fontan procedure, and she underwent the Fontan procedure. However, post-procedure, she had severely high chest tube drainage and low cardiac output. And so when we took her back to the cath lab, this is what we saw. So this is an angiogram of her Fontan. You can see what the problem is. And this is exactly, this highlights the problem with the Fontan circulation. So because there is no ventricle pumping to the pulmonary arterial circulation, any kinking or stenosis in the, in the Fontan circuit, as you can see here in bilateral pulmonary arteries, can potentially create havoc with the circulation, if not frank catastrophe. And so of course, in this particular situation, we stented both the pulmonary arteries and the patient um, had a great result from this standpoint. So the problem was she remained intubated and continued to have poor cardiac output. And so, uh, and she had elevated venous pressures. So at this point in time, we had to come up with some other solution for this. And this was an extra cardiac conduit. So of course, she did not come with a fenestration. So what we ended up doing was we took her back to the cath lab and we created a fenestration. So here you see, we have crossed into the um, common atrium and we're ballooning a stent to create that fenestration. There's the stent being deployed, and there's our fenestration. So what you can see on the bottom right-hand side of the screen, we're injecting through in the fontan, and then you can see the wire going into the common atrium into the common ventricle. And now you can see that there has been decompression of that fontan system. So what this basically means is that sometimes um, at the expense of oxygenation or potentially creating a patient who has a saturation in the 80s, we do create a fenestration because what that allows then for is that this blue blood coming in from the SVC to the IVC can potentially mix via that fenestration into the common atrium into the systemic ventricle and give you purple blood into the systemic circulation. So, in summary, the Fontan circulation relies completely on a passive venous flow for pulmonary blood flow. And any type of elevated pulmonary vascular resistance can result in poor cardiac output. So fenestration of the Fontan, allowing for some degree of right to left shunt, may be required to allow these patients to survive and have some sort of semblance of a reasonable cardiac output. So I've covered a lot of ground today. Um, I talked to you a little bit about the difference between a pre-tricuspid and post-tricuspid shunt using ASDs and VSDs as an example. I talked to you about right-sided lesions using the tetralogy of Fallot as an example and highlighting the importance of continuous surveillance of these patients and their risk of complications such as ventricular arrhythmias. I talked to you about left-sided lesions using a coarctation and a completely um, interrupted aorta as an example, highlighting the need to assess for other left-sided lesions in these patients, as well as evaluating them for cerebral aneurysm. I talked about transposition in three different forms, the two different types of palliations for transposition, the complete transposition of the great arteries, um, as well as L-transposition of the great arteries. And then finally, I talked to you about the potential complications for Fontan.
So um, I think one of the most important things um, is to be suspicious of patients who say they are asymptomatic. As the great Carol Warns once ta taught us, these patients were born with congenital heart disease. They don't actually know necessarily what normal is supposed to be. So when they say they're normal or they're asymptomatic, they don't have a great frame of reference. So what that means is when you have a patient who has been quote unquote repaired, refer them early and refer them often to the, your local adult congenital heart specialist. Thank you.